Over the course of my 27 years, I was involved in well over 500 undercover operations. You know, I, I, I was threatened with guns to my head. I was threatened to have my fingers cut off, uh, you know, all while answering questions and all while like having to maintain your lie. Hello. Good morning. I see that we have the same barber. We do. Yours looks you? better than mine, but thank you. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Who are you? Well, I'm a husband. I'm a father. Um, I'm a retired federal agent. I'm an author. I coach high school football. So you can uh, pick whatever title you want to put on me. I wear what? a couple different hats. Marvelous. And what's your name? My name is Jay Dobbins. Jay Dobbins. Well, I'm Leon. And I uh, hope that the people told you that I don't know who you are. I understand that <laughs> we're just going to go with the flow. And so thank you for having me. I'm flattered to be here and welcome to your audience. Okay, cool, cool. So I, I, I had a high school teacher who really changed my life in a very profound way. Um, I loved playing soccer and for years I was a goalkeeper um, and I always wanted to be a, a striker. And I said to him one day, I said, I'd like to be a striker. And he said to me, why do you want to be a striker? And I explained, and he said, okay, you can be a striker. And for like 10 games, I was the world's worst striker. And anyone else would have like said, Leon, go back to, to being a goalkeeper. Um, but he didn't. He kept on kind of giving me inspiration and making me feel like I could do it. And I ended up being the top scorer for like three seasons as a striker. And I share that story with you because one of the things that you said that, um, that you do is you're a high school uh, coach, right? So my question to you is why, why did you decide to be a high school coach? You could have done many things. And that was one of the things you chose. Yeah, I think it's uh, like teachers and coaches are my, her my heroes, just like uh, you. They impact lives. Uh, they touch lives uh, well into the, whatever that person that you're interacting with, their future is. Um, and like you said, like the experience you had with a coach, you're trying to find the best fit for your team and for your kids, but you're also trying to inspire and promote like what they want to do and what they want to be. And so it's, it's fluid. It changes all the time. And, and how do you juggle being a high school teacher and a federal agent? Well, I'm a retired federal agent, oh, retired so that makes federal. it easy. Yeah. I retired uh, uh, eight years ago. And so I had a football background. I played football in high school and college. I played a short time professionally. So I always had a love for the game. And uh, it's just a way to give back. It's a way for me to uh, impact uh, the kids I coach and use some of the life lessons that I uh, learned throughout my, uh, at least my adult life, um, and try to translate those to them through football. Okay, cool. And what kind of federal agent were you? Um, I was an ATF agent, which uh, ATF, we enforce the... Uh, federal firearms and explosives laws. We have a lot of the violent crime laws. And I spent the majority of my career uh, in undercover assignments. Wow. That takes balls of steel. Um, what type of stuff did you do? Uh, well, you know, over the course of my 27 years, I was involved in well over 500 undercover operations. Everything from uh, street buys to gang infiltrations and home invasion, uh, disrupting home invasion schemes and uh, playing a contract killer and murder for hire cases um, from making, you know, street buys of guns and drugs. Um, so, like I said, to, to long term operations from uh, like like pea shooter guns up to shoulder launched rockets from street dope to cartel level dope, 
from homemade pipe bombs to C4 remote control uh, servo activated uh, devices. So um, I had a pretty good spectrum of experiences as, as an undercover agent. And, and how does one get into the realm of being an undercover agent? Uh, well, you have to you have to have a desire for it. It's it's not for everybody. Um, uh, it's it's something that I wanted to pursue when I started. I didn't know if I'd even be good at it. I wanted to try it. I wanted to uh, give myself a chance. Um, and it's like anything else. The, the more you do it, the more experience you gain, the more training you receive. Um, it builds your confidence, and uh, confidence builds comfort. And those are two critical elements to undercover work. You have to be confident and you have to be comfortable. You, you have to be comfortable uh, selling criminals, oftentimes violent criminals, uh, of a persona, of a fake version of you. And were there any ever mo- were there any were there ever any moments where you were nearly caught? Yeah, several over the course of that time. Uh, there was times when I was questioned hard. There was times when my cover was compromised. Um, I was subjected to uh, private investigator background uh, checks, um, polygraph examinations at gunpoint. Um, you know, I, I, I was threatened with guns to my head. I was threatened to have my fingers cut off, uh, you know, all while answering questions and all while um, like having to maintain your lie having to maintain your deception under those circumstances. So like I said, it, it's not for everybody. There's all different uh, aspects to, to law enforcement. Uh, undercover work is really nothing more than a tool in an investigator's toolbox. And it's just, it's, it's, it's where my love was and where my passion was. And so I just did it the best I could every day. I had good days. I had bad days. I had days when I had successes and I had days when I failed. Um, Really, when it comes down to it, um, I'm a very common man who was placed in some uncommon situations and just did the best I could every day. What is it? What does it feel like to have a loaded gun at your head? Uh, well, I, it's it's never comfortable. You're never you never want that situation. You do everything you can to avoid it. Um, but the great ones, the ones who are uh, exceptional, can even when they're nervous inside, even when they're they're fearful inside, can project a sense of confidence. Um, if if I'm telling you a lie, and if I'm trying to sell you that I'm someone other than who I am, if I don't believe it. How am I going to make you believe it? How am I going to convince you of it? So you really have to believe that you are that that person, that character that you're portraying. Because, it, because if, if, if I can't accept it, and now I'm being questioned on it under treacherous, perilous circumstances, like you're not going to believe it. And then when you don't believe it... Um, you know, the people I dealt with, they're not the kind of people who are going to say, don't come around here anymore. We don't like you or we don't believe you. They're going to hit you on the back of the head with a baseball bat or drag a straight razor across your throat. So it's it truly is, at least at times, life and death. Yeah, I mean, so you basically passed the polygraph test. Um, Passed it and, you know, like... I don't know that the people that were necessarily operating it even knew what they were doing, but I had to believe that they did. Um, you know, when, when you're working undercover, everything you do is uniquely scrutinized because you're dealing with people who are, they're paranoid and they're paranoid because they have to be. It is part of the business they're in. They're untrusting. They're uh, weary of outsiders. Um, that's how they stay out of jail. That's how they stay out of prison is through their paranoia. So everything you say, everything you do, how you look, uh, the car you drive, where you live, how you treat people, um, all those things are are being hyper scrutinized to see if you really are who you're telling them you are. You must have a wealth of understanding about humanity 
and about how human beings behave. I, I think that is uh, a key element for the, the truly great undercover operators out there is that they have uh, a, a really great understanding of the human factor. Um, and they understand when to push, they understand when to back off. They understand when to let that uh, ego flare up and uh, the confidence to show, and they understand when it's the right time to be humble and and quiet and reserved. Um, and and you, you just, you get that through experience. You get that through dealing with a lot of different people in a lot of different situations and you figure out what works for you and what doesn't work for you. And it strikes me that the ability to understand humanity in your previous role as an undercover agent helps you to understand the humanity and the human experience of a high school kid. Yeah, I think that, you know, the um, one of the lessons that I tell the players, uh, one of the lessons I've learned the hard way is, is for me personally, I was always a person who wisdom came to me right after I needed it. Um, and so like I tell, I tell, I tell these kids, like, think about what you're doing, where you're at, who you're with, think about what's going to come out of your mouth because, um, when you don't, and, and when you don't apply some wisdom to that, a lot of times you put yourself behind the eight ball and you're trying to catch up. Mm, and it often doesn't go very well, right? Well, it's one thing, um, if you're playing a football game and things don't go well um, versus my previous life, when you're playing the game and things don't go well, when you lose in a football game, no one's going to die. When you make a bad decision or when you make a mistake in my previous life, people die. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what is your, what is your book about? Um, I've written two books. Um, actually, my first book is uh, called No Angel, My Harrowing Undercover Journey to the Inner Circle of the Hell's Angels. Oh, wow. Um, so I spent two years uh, as part of my career uh, infiltrating the Hell's Angels. And then my second book is called Catching Hell, A True Story of Abandonment and Betrayal. Um, and those came out about uh, 10 years apart. No Angel came out first, which is uh, basically the story of, of that undercover operation investigating the Hells Angels gang and then catching hell is a bigger picture story, more of a memoir type um, book. Do you know what? Is there a show about you? Um, there's several. I've done I've done several uh, several shows about some of my undercover work. I think I saw a show that you were uh, it was about it was about you. Um, very, very fascinating. I mean like unbelievable stuff. For those people that haven't watched the show or don't know about the book, can you kind of give us a, a kind of a, the, the the story arc of, of the book, the Hell's Angel, the, the first Hell's Angel book, and kind of, you know, what you had to go through, what happened? Because I remember when I watched, when I watched the documentary or whatever it was, I was like, holy moly, how on earth did this man, like, do this? And here we are speaking to each other. So I'd love it if you could share like as much as you can within this, you know, period of time. Yeah, sure. So um, uh, my career started in 1987. I wanted to do undercover work. That's that, that was my goal. That was my objective. Um, I got hired on a Monday, four days later uh, on a Thursday, I was shot Um I'm going to show you that if you can see it, that's the, that's the shirt I was wearing um, on November 19th, 1987. There's a, uh, a hole that goes through and through it. Um, the bullet went in my back. It passed through my lung. It narrowly missed my heart. It exited my chest. And so, you know, after four days on the job with literally no training and no experience, I was bleeding to death in the dirt and garbage of a trailer park with blood coming out of my chest, like you were holding your thumb over the end of a garden hose. And for some people, for most people, at least maybe for most sane people or people that have 
a, a logical brain in their head, that would have been enough. And, and for me, that was very inspiring. Um, not, not to get hurt, not to get shot. No one ever wants or, or, or wants that, or we do everything we can to try to avoid that. But I was doing what I loved. I wanted to try to get as close as I could to the violence. I wanted to, uh, when I was handed a badge and a gun, I took that responsibility very serious. I took it as an honor and as a privilege. I was being asked to stand up on behalf of good and innocent people and put myself in the path of society's predators and violence on their behalf. And like that was that was a huge honor for me. So I got off to a really rough start, but I just wanted to I wanted to try again. And then like, you know what, like four days on the job, I had a bullet go through my chest and I felt like I was invincible. I felt like I was bulletproof. You know, like that doesn't happen. That's not supposed to happen. And it did. And I was there and I was still motivated and I was still excited to try to come back and and try again. So fast forward 15 years down the road of, of all these undercover experiences that I told you about, and the opportunity came up to try to infiltrate the Hells Angels motorcycle gang in Arizona. And I, like, I'm not the best undercover agent. Um, I never portrayed myself to be. I've never claimed to be. Um, but I was always willing. I was always willing to raise my hand for assignments that either people didn't want, they thought were too dangerous, they thought were impossible. So um, probably my strength wasn't necessarily in my skill as an undercover operator. It was in my willingness to try and, and not being afraid to fail. Um, I think that's huge for all of us in life is that you have to like take risks. It's okay to fail. It's okay to make mistakes. That's how we learn. Um, I wasn't afraid of failing. I was afraid of how I would feel about myself if I looked back on my life and didn't try. And so for two years, um, I ran around with the Hells Angels in Arizona and on the uh, West Coast of the United States. And it was it was a it was a pretty good adventure, and it that that story is told in my No Angel book. And how did you how did you bring them down? I, I remember, if my memory serves me correct, a lot of the top people ended up in prison. This is from from the documentary that I that I watched with you in it. Um, how, how, but I can't remember exactly how you did it. Well, I mean, it was it was time, it was patience. Of course, you know, over two years, like these are uh, not the kind of people that welcome you into their world very quickly. You have to gain trust. You have to gain loyalty. Um, in some cases, uh, I built relationships that turned into love. Um, all along the way, knowing that you were going to betray the people that you were befriending. And, you know, a lot of people struggle with that. I struggle with it. Um, anybody who's ever been betrayed, everyone, who, anyone who's ever been lied to, um, that, that's not how God makes us. God does not, does not design us to treat other people that way. But it was part of my job. My job was to investigate violent crime. And ultimately, the step that put us over the top was that we faked the murder of a, a rival, a gang rival, and then presented this fabricated evidence of a homicide to our suspects to ultimately prove our loyalty um, and, and the trust we had and the faith we had in the gang, which is in the end what put us over the top. Hmm. And, and, and how many people ended up going away? Well, I'll tell you, it's, a, it's an interesting story, and there's a backstory to it. Um, when the case ended, I think we indicted 55 people. And uh, on racketeering charges, we had uh, people uh, charged with homicide. 
um, like you name it, from from murder down to conspiracy charges and and street crime charges. Ultimately, the prosecution of the case was disrupted because the good guy side, the government side, got into arguments on how to present the case and what evidence to be presented. And the ins, the infighting on the government side ultimately impacted the prosecution. So the prosecution uh, wasn't, wasn't what the investigation warranted. Um, I can say this, you know, that case ran from 2001 to 2003. So like it was like 20 years ago, I was in the heart of that investigation. Um, the evidence that we uh, developed, the, the testimony, agent testimony, um, based on thousands of hours of recorded conversations, is every bit as prosecutable and winnable today as it was 20 years ago, based on evidence. But as what happens many times, uh, investigating a case and then delivering it into a courtroom, lots of things can happen. And, and as an investigator, I can't do all of it. I can't, I, I can, inv I can use my skills and my tradecraft to investigate. And then I turn that evidence and that information over to uh, case agents and attorneys who then deliver it into a courtroom to juries and judges. Um, along that path, uh, the infighting within the government, like impacted ultimately the success of what our case should have been. Wow. You know, I, I have to ask you this question. You're clearly no longer undercover because here you are on my podcast. <laughs> However, do you not fear for your life? Uh, there was a time and place when my true identity was initially exposed that it was, it was a real hard time. Uh, death and violence threats started flooding in against me and my family. Um, there were murder contracts on me. Uh, there were documented threats to uh, inject me with uh, the HIV virus um, so that like my death or my murder wouldn't be so obvious. Um, threats to uh, videotape the gang rape of my wife. Threats to kidnap my kids from school. Um, so th there was a point in time where uh, the people that I had investigated were looking for payback and were looking for retaliation. Um, so like to a long answer to your short question, do I fear for my life? Um, if I live in fear, they win. If, if I let them completely alter my lifestyle and my path, they win. Um, I'm not looking for a problem. I don't want a problem. I will do everything I can to avoid a problem. I'll walk away if I can. I'll run away if I can. Um, I'm not trying. I'm nobody's knight in shining armor. I don't consider myself anything close to a hero. Um, but I'm also not going to live in a cave and be Osama bin Laden and wait for someone to shoot a rocket at me. Um, I have to live my life. Um, and now, you know, to be honest with you, over the course of 20 years, um, I think some of the some of the hatred for me that existed in the past, uh, like like many times when we have disputes with people, just over the course of time, it 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 mellows out a little bit. Um, there's people that, that, that I investigated that will never forgive me. I don't forgive. I don't expect them to forgive me. I will say this. I never set out to ruin anybody's life. That was not my job. My job wasn't going out, wasn't to go out and to destroy people's lives. It was to investigate violent crime. Now, if I happen to be in your presence or gain knowledge of crimes that you were involved in, that was my job. That was my job to help protect, like I said earlier, the good and innocent people in society. Um, 
So I don't know if that's a good answer to your question or not, but um, yeah. are, 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 are there people out there who still, you know, intend harm for me? I, I, I'm sure there are. But at this point, 20 years later, what does anybody have to gain from it? Mm. They're, they're, they're not, there's, there's nothing left to avoid unless they want to carry out their own bad intentions towards me. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it, to me, and I'm probably projecting, but to me, I, I, I guess I would feel a lot of fear. But I guess at the same time, I haven't had the experience of being a federal agent for, I think you said 27 years. Well, I, I think that to say that there's like no fear and that I operate uh, and live my life with uh, 100% comfort, uh, comfort, that, that, that would be, that would be a, that would be a lie. That wouldn't be true. I know that there's people out there um, who don't care for me and given the right opportunity might take advantage of it. Um, I try to put my, I try not to put myself uh, in those types of situations where I would be uh, excessively vulnerable. Mm. Um, and I also um, d- don't, I, I never mocked anybody or made fun of or teased or tried to add to the humiliation of anybody that I investigated. Um, I, I tried to treat the people that I investigated with some human dignity. You know, like like I had sold them that that Jay Dobbins, the federal agent, was actually Jay Bird Davis, a, a gun runner, a debt collector, a contract killer. When that's revealed to someone, and and when someone has believed you and trusted you, that is that that's a humiliating experience. Like I never felt any satisfaction on trying to make that worse. Um, actually, I tried to be like a, a, a human being to people and and not necessarily to comfort them, but to say, you know what, man, you, like you did some bad things. Um, but it, today doesn't need to be the worst day of your life. Today could be the best day of your life. Today could be the day where you get a chance to hit the reset button. Some of them have, some of them haven't. Um, I can't make their personal choices for them. I can't make their life choices for them. Mm. Tell me, what, 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 are, what are some of the greatest lessons you think you've learned from doing what you do? And oh, we talk, man, we the kind of greatest about lessons. Yeah. Just the like big picture lessons that, um, you know, that I try to convey to the kids that I coach now, like life lessons. Um, I tell them, If you want people to remember your name, you have to do something that they can never forget. Otherwise, you're just you're just like everybody else. Um, If you want something that you've never had, then you're going to have to do things that you've never done to get it. Um, And it's all it, it comes down to believing in yourself. Those, those two things ultimately land on, do I believe in myself? Do I trust myself? Do I have confidence to bet on myself and take all my chips and push them into the middle of the table and say, I am going to bet on me to be a success? And what do they say when you say that to them? Um, well, you know what? I, I think it sounds good. I think it's easier to say than it is to do. Um, it's one thing to speak it. It's another thing to actually put it in play. But if you can, if you can uh, adapt that mindset where that um, I, I'm going to take risks, I'm going to do some things, I'm going to press the envelope. I'm, I'm going to stretch things out and see what I'm capable of. I think all of us are truly capable of many times more than what we think we are. Um, We have to push ourselves there. And then sometimes people in our lives, we have to push other people there. We see people in our lives all the time who like aren't uh, everything that they can be. 
And as, and as their friends, as, as when we cross paths with those people in our life that we love, we have an obligation to encourage them to see how far they can go and to see how truly great they can be. Because I think a lot of times we sell ourselves short and, we're, and, and, and we really are capable of greatness. Um, now, whether we get there on our own or whether we get there through the encouragement of others, who, like, who cares how you get there? I agree 100%. Um, uh, and without mentioning names, are there any kids that you've, that you've worked with in, in high school that you've been able to get them from a really bad place to a really good place? Well, I'll tell you, um, so in sports, like we judge a lot of times as coaches, we ju judge our success based on um, how that athlete performs. But really the, the, the judgment of it is like, how do they perform in life? And so I've coached kids who've gone on and are doing amazing things. I've coached kids um, who, like many people, like myself at times, who've struggled with elements of life. But when those kids that you've touched come back and either say thank you, that you had a hand in where they are and what they're doing, and, and maybe even more importantly, the kids who are struggling, who are saying like, man, like I'm in trouble, I'm having a hard time, can you help me? Um, that's, that's why teachers and coaches are my heroes. Um, we ask, we ask those people to educate our kids and teach them how to read and teach them how to write. Um, but we also ask them to socialize our kids and teach them manners and teach them how to treat each other. And then we ask teachers to uh, check backpacks for paraphernalia and check lockers for, for, for drugs and for weapons and check their head for lice and check their bodies for bruises, for signs of abuse. And then we give them a blackboard and a piece of chalk and we underpay them. And then we turn our kids over to them and say, like, now turn, make, make sure that my kid turns out right. And, and we got teachers out there that are just great public servants that love that challenge and embrace it, um, knowing that they're underappreciated, knowing that they're underpaid, they're underthanked. Um, they're, they're, they're huge, huge uh, contributors to just the well-being of the world. I, I, I yes, and I, I, I've had quite a few of those, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, did you have a hero that put you on the straight and narrow? If you were to, that's an English phrase of, did you have a hero or someone who kind of got you to be the person you are today that you can think of? Yeah, I mean that's an easy answer for me. It was it was my parents, um, and, and I think you know a lot of kids in today's world grow up in single parent homes. They grow up you know without parents. Uh, me, my for, for me myself, my dad was a huge influence in me. There's kids that grow up without fathers in their homes, without a you know, boys that grow up and girls for that matter, that grow up without a, a, a strong male influence. Um, and so, you know, those, those things that I try to speak to, to, to my players and to my own kids were spoken to me, like it may be in different ways from my dad. Hmm. That leads me to a question I've been wanting to ask. And that is, if one of your kids, your, your, the kids, you know, you're their father, not the high school kids. If one of your kids came to you and said, Dad, I want to be an undercover agent just like you, what would you, what would you say? Who, um, to really, it's, it's never been harder to be a, a lawman or a law woman than it is today with, with, just the, the, I mean, you just look at what's going on in the world as we speak. Um, and you look at um, the conflicts, the global conflicts out there. You look at uh, race relations and societal issues. Um, 
Every, the, the, there's, there's men and women who choose to be uh, law enforcement officers who every morning their alarm clock goes off and they put their feet on the ground and they pour a cup of coffee and they uh, pour some cereal in a bowl um, and kiss their families goodbye, not knowing with no guarantee that they ever get to see them again. And they go out willingly, enthusiastically to go to work to protect and defend other people's families. Um, and in the process, they do it. They're disrespected. Uh, they're humiliated. Um, they're videotaped. Uh, there's people out there that want to take away the funding that's used to train them and support them. And they still go. They still go to work knowing all those things because what they want to contribute to the world is much is something much bigger than themselves. Um, and, and, and in a very selfish me world, um, those people are heroes as well. And would, what would you say to your kids if they wanted to be an undercover agent specifically? I would say um, if that's what you love, and if that's what you have a passion for, um, and if every day you can be excited to go do that and face those challenges, then go do it and, and, and go be amazing. Be the best that's ever been. Um, but along the way, along the way, don't forget about the people that love you and care about you um, because, you know, I made mistakes along the way. I put my career and I put uh, the missions I was on in front of the people that uh, that cared about me the most. Um, I made selfish de decisions. And now at 60 years old, I can see them. And I have regrets for a, a lot of the things I, I said and did. Mm. You know, when we first got on the podcast, clearly I don't know who you are, but I will tell you I was pretty intimidated and I was pretty, I was like, oh my God, this is going to end really badly. <laughs> I felt scared. Um, just, but clearly as we've continued the conversation, you have so much wisdom and you've experienced so much and you're using that wisdom to help people, right? And you're inspiring kids. But you you have an intimidating presence. And I thought to myself, should I even say this? And I was like, no, yeah, what's the point? The whole point of this conversation is that we we just have a real genuine conversation. And I feel like I couldn't like have got off this podcast without sharing that with you, right? That at first I felt intimidated. Uh, even before you started telling me your story, right? But then as the story continued and we kind of got to connect with each other, I felt less intimidation. I felt less scared. And uh, I felt like, oh, this guy's a, a, a good fellow, a good chap doing some great things in the world. Uh, and my scaredness reduced. Well, you know what? I'll tell you, um, any, any knowledge or wisdom I have came from my own mistakes and it came from my own failures. Um, a lot of them, it took me a long time to figure out, um, some of the hardships that I I've had, um, there's always a silver lining, um, through some of the hard things I've had, I've become more spiritual. Um, I've grown closer to God. Um, I realized the hard way that if the only time you're talking to God is when you're in trouble, you're in trouble. Um, I, I lived for a big portion of my life. I lived a selfish life. I made decisions for me, about me, for my career. And in the process, uh, for a big portion of my life, I was not a good husband. And I was not a good father um, because I was selfish. The people that loved me and cared about me the most 
I treated the worst. I took for granted. Um, I don't want other people to, uh, to do that. I don't want people in my profession to do that. I don't want the kids I coach to do that. Um, I had to experience some really hard times to be able to tell them those stories and convey those lessons with credibility. Like I, I tell my kids all the time, don't make the mistakes I made. I can tell you how they turn out. It's not good. Go make your own mistakes. That's part of life is to make mistakes. Just don't repeat mine. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. I can tell you what I did wrong. Like, let's try to figure out how to avoid that. Wise, wise words. Man, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's so funny how I have saw a documentary about you and it's stuck in my head. And I was like, as I said earlier, man, the guy had balls of steel. And then here I am doing a podcast with you. And as you know, I have no idea. I had no idea who you are. No one tells me. It's clearly something that just is, is, is organic. Um, but it's a very, very powerful, profound story. Uh, and I'm glad people are going to get the opportunity to hear it. It's also interesting. It's fascinating. It's kind of like I had a conversation with a KGB spy. Right. Um, I saw that interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, the kind of skills that you need as a spy, right, are in some way similar to the type of skills you need as an undercover agent. And a spy understands the, the human experience and under, an undercover agent needs to understand the human experience. And I am not a spy or an undercover agent, but I love understanding the human experience. Well, if you have time, I'm going to tell you one quick story. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and, it, and it ties into uh, the human experience, the human factor, uh, the kindness factor, all those things, right? So I, I, was, I, I told you the story of, you know, how I have regrets for some of the life decisions I've made. So I'm in this Hells Angels case. And, and for the years leading up to that, uh, my son, every time I would come home, which was hit or miss, there was never any schedule or plan to it. Um, I would do the bare minimum I needed to do to keep my family functioning. I'd pay the bills, pat the kids on the head, uh, have a conversation with my wife. I could not wait to get back out and be smoking and joking with gangsters. I loved being around the violence. Um, and every time I'd go to leave home, my son, who was a, a young boy at the time, would run out in the yard and grab a stone out of the yard and bring it to me. Dad, don't leave yet. I got something for you. So for years, I had collected these rocks from my little boy. Um, I had literally hundreds of them, kept one in my pocket, um, had in the saddlebags of my motorcycle, my undercover car, my undercover house, these good luck charms that this little boy was giving me. Um, I was handing them out to my partners. I was like, we are in the midst of this tornado of violence. And I don't know what it is about these rocks, but keep this with you. There's some kind of blessing on these, right? So right before I was ready to leave home to go commit the the, the fake murder that I mentioned earlier in our conversation. My son runs up, dad, don't leave yet. And he, and he hands me this rock and I've, I've hung on to it. I've had this every day with me for 20 years. He's like, dad, don't leave yet. I've been saving this one for you. It's special. It's shaped like a heart. So I was a 40 year old father trying to comfort my 10 year old son. And I said, I'm almost done. And when I get back, all those things that I should have been doing with you, we're going to do. We're going to ride bikes. We're going to play catch. We're going to wrestle. We're going to read books. We're going to go swimming. Um, and I said, it's all because of your good luck charms. And this little boy standing on my driveway and tears start running down his cheeks. And, he's, and, I, and I told him, I said, these things work so great. I've given them to all my partners. And he's crying and sobbing. And he said, those aren't good luck charms. And you shouldn't have given them to anybody else. They were just for you. And like, I'm 40 years old and I can't figure out like, what's, 
like what he's saying. And he said, that was for you to put in your pocket. And every time you think someone was going to hurt you, I wanted you to be able to put your hand in there and touch it. And that was like me being there to help you fight back. That is what I had done in this selfish world that I was living to my son. My job wasn't to go like be Donnie Brasco, be the greatest undercover agent ever or infiltrate gangs or rid the streets of guns or drugs or bombs or violence or take over the Hells Angels. My job was to raise a good kid. And I had failed. I had failed my own son. And I had to have a 10-year-old boy teach that to me in his own way. So, so like when we're talking about this big picture of like the human factor and how we treat each other and, and what we do and who we are, how that impacts someone else, man, I, like I had to learn that lesson in a hard way. And I don't want other people to make the same mistakes I made to figure it out. I will tell you that as you were sharing that story of your son and the rocks, there were goosebumps all over. And thank you for opening your heart and and sharing such a powerful moment in your life. I don't know if you share that normally, but if you don't, you need to share that story again and again and again and again. Well, I'll tell you what, I, uh, one, of the, one of the greatest windows of time in my life is I took a mission trip to Africa um, and I was very caught up. There was a lot of threats spinning around me at the time and there was a lot of things going on. And I, like, I went to these villages where there was no clean drinking water and the villages were decimated by disease and by war atrocities and and the, the like these these kids we went to orphanages where the kids were living in an existence where they couldn't even hope to have hope that there was nothing for them there was no future and when we went in and showed them some love the smiles and the joy that just having someone touch their life brought to them was eye-opening for me. It was life-changing for me. These kids, the, the, like their life expectancy was very low. And during that life, it was not going to be a pleasant ex- existence. They were going to be hungry and thirsty and sick. And a lot of these villages had never seen a white face before. Some of these kids had never seen white, any, uh, another white person before. And to see their reaction, to just have someone care about them, to spend time with them, to put some love on them. It was, it, 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 it really, it, it opened my eyes even wider to the human factor and to the kind of impact we can have on each other if we just treat each other with some love and some kindness. There's a very famous song by Jerry and the Pacemakers called You'll Never Walk Alone. Have you heard that song? I think I have. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart. I forget the rest, but it's the song of my football club. And what you've just explained with your son and with the kids is basically a way to inspire people to walk on, to keep going. Um, and maybe, maybe that was the purpose of everything that you did. Uh, you know what? I hope so. I hope that the, that the hard things I went through, that the mistakes I made, um, I have to believe that they were for a purpose that there was that there's a silver lining behind them whether I'm finding it or not like I don't know but I'm trying I'm trying to find it um and time will tell time will tell indeed keep walking my friend thank you thank you so much and thank you for having me 
Hello everyone, it's Leon here, aka The Kindness Guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have 